Okay, welcome to ICALA, everyone. Uh, you're coming to our space on a Monday after a glorious opening weekend of our current season of new exhibitions, featuring the work of Milford Graves in the show Fundamental Frequency that came from Artist Space in New York, Jacqueline Kiyomi Gork in our project room, and Christine Sun Kim's mural titled Bounce Back in our courtyard, in our parking lot. We also have a new bookshelf residency, which is what you see on the bookshelves over there with uh, the resident Cardboard House Press, and then continuing with Reparations Club, the bookseller side. Uh, we know this is a busy week of art fairs with Freeze and Felix and Los Angeles Art Show. And uh, in case you didn't see the exhibitions before this talk, you can come back tomorrow and see it because we're going to be open exceptionally on Tuesday when we're usually closed from noon to 6 p.m. and for the rest of the week. So um, we're so happy to host this conversation and to partner with Extra. It will not be the last time um, because we, we enjoy, we've done it before. Uh, Los Angeles has a great publication in Extra, so we want to support that. Um, Extra has the most um, compelling and insightful content, which brings us to tonight's program, a museum for the afterlife, Gala Poras Kim and Mariana Fernandez in conversation, which is a live extension of the article that appeared in the issue with the amazing performance artist, Ron Athey on the cover. Uh, Ron Athey, uh, if you know or don't know, was here uh, in a retrospective in 2021 titled Queer Communion, Ron Athey, curated by Amelia Jones, Vice Dean of Academics and Research and Chair of Critical Studies at USC Roski School of Art and Design. So ICLA always welcomes lively debate and introspection about the field of museums. And by doing so, we hope to encourage and advocate and represent progressive practices, particularly when it involves the perspectives of artists. So uh, thank you to Extra and to Gala Porras Kim and Mariana Fernandez for arranging this evening's program with us. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Oscar. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this exciting conversation on a Monday night. Um, I'm Nora Khan. I'm executive director of Project X Foundation, which is the publisher of Extra. And we want to thank Oscar and Tanya and the entire team at ICALA for making this conversation happen and for being excellent hosts on a very busy week. Um, Extra, you may know, celebrates uh, turning 25 this year of publishing criticism and artist writing. And this issue is the second issue of our 24th volume. And it features Mariana's brilliant essay, A Museum for the Afterlife, um, on Gala's shows at Amont and Commonwealth and Council here in Los Angeles. And our team is a little breathless. We just returned from Mexico City um, and the Art Book Fair where, Gala, you just opened an exhibition and also returned yesterday along with us, um, open exhibition at MUAC, the University Museum of Contemporary Art, and a beautiful exhibition um, titled Between Lapses of Histories. So we're really thrilled you both can join us, um, Gala, especially as your practice is one we've been swimming in for years now, a uh, practice that you describe as being about the social and political context that influence how intangible things such as sounds, language, and history have been framed through the fields of linguistics, history and conservation. Her work considers the ways institutions shape inherited codes and forms, and conversely, how objects can shape the context in which they're placed. Gala has had solo exhibitions at Cadist, Amont Foundation, Gasworks in London, CAM in St. Louis, and has a show upcoming in 2023 at the Fowler. Her work has been included in the Whitney Biennial, the Ural Industrial Biennial, Guangzhou and Sao Paulo Biennials too, in 2021. And she was a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard at the, and was an artist in residence at the Getty from 2020 to 2022. Also joining us, Mariana, um, we're gonna be diving into your essay and focusing on some quotes from your essay and I really encourage everyone to get a copy afterwards and read her essay. Mariana is a writer and curator based in New York. 
She's held curatorial positions at Performa, the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, MPOC, and the Clark Art Institute. And her writing and criticism appear in publications such as Freeze, Bomb, and the Brooklyn Rail. So uh, this discussion has four <laughs> themes that we want to cover. I know people like to know what they're getting into before I talk. It's comforting to know where we're going to go. So we've timed it, and it'll be about 15 minutes, leaving 10 minutes for questions. So I know there'll be lots of questions from this audience. I can see, and I've heard some bubbling up beforehand. So try to get them ready. We want to start with, maybe I can start with like grounding some of the show that we saw at MUAC um, between lapses of histories, and specifically the letters that start a lot of your works. And before I went into the show, um, I had a visit along with Extra in the archives of MUAC with Sol Hanaro, who's the curator of collections there. And we were taking a tour of the museum's archives, and I think you know Sol's ethos and her energy. And this is an astounding archive of artist publications and posters and protest materials. And Sol was intriguingly describing the archives as living, um, that the cost of the archive living and preserving the archive is actually that it might decay. And the decay is actually the cost of the archive's knowledge propagating. And the decay is an essential part of them moving on in time in an effective way. And I found this like a really beautiful moment to have before entering your show upstairs, where we get to see so many of the works that are described in Mariana's essay. And you know, to ground the discussion, I thought we could look at two letters, two of the four that ground the exhibition, and we'll explore all four letters in this conversation. And the first one that you see up here is a letter that you wrote to the director of the National Museum of Brazil on the issue of Luzia, the oldest human in the collection, whose remains were burned to ashes in the devastating 2018 fire. And uh, the title of the letter says it all, leaving the institution by cremation is easier than through a deaccession policy. The museum was working to restore Lucia's body through DNA testing and keep her remains as an object. And in the letter you argue uh, that her wishes for her burial are completely ignored. And you write, quote, in, in the object that we'll see next to the letter, this tissue with ash from the fire might be the closest thing to a cinerary urn to hold her cremains or remains until you might try to see her personhood. And she stops being merely an object in the collection. And then you go on to challenge the director and say, when you let go of the shape you think she should be as an object, she will return to her life as a corpse once again. In a letter to the director of the Guangzhou National Museum, you also write on human remains which have lost the option to express their desires for preservation, given their unknown resting place. To conjure the deceased, deceased wishes, you practice encromancy, dipping ink in a water pool, and then asking the dead to reveal their wishes to you. And in many of these stunning marbled pieces, you suggest to the director that this might be a step to see the person's agency and to honor their personhood. So my first question to you is between Lucia's remains and the spirits of the dead that are buried uh, in the museum, uh, and later we'll look at your advocacy for like the Mayan rain god, Chalk, the dead in the pyramids, even the mold in the British Museum. A lot of reviewers and writers and Mariana to um, describe you as a defender of ghosts and figures in the far past. And in some of these pieces, I'm really struck and like moved by how you move us back and forth and pass and how you mount these defenses for people who aren't here with us, for things we can barely see, uh, along with the critiques that you also mount to that institution. So I was wondering if you could start us off by talking a little bit about how you came to this practice of defending the unseen and defending those who are far away. Um, you know, in the past and beyond our time and context, and how do you think of these figures in relation to yourself and in your research? Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, I don't necessarily think I'm defending anybody, per se, and I love that this conversation is about cataloging and sorting information, because even in my own work and the way that it has been framed in the exhibition was 
also the beginning of the process of sorting even my own work within the greater shape of the museum. So for example, that people think it's an anchormancy work is something that has been cataloged already as when I just wanted to find a artistic process that I couldn't control. And so that involved ink, of course, because it's been the, the paper marbling process. But, you know, it was interesting to me that the curator of the show said, oh, it's like anchormancy from one of our conversations in the studio visit. And then that stuck in the catalog. And now people are like, are you a witch? Can you actually <laughs> figure that shit out? I'm like, nope. <laughs> and so do you see? And so what I, to answer your question, or I can't, to get to answer your question is more like the idea always came from a very selfish place to try and figure out how to make art and how it would live in the institution because as a student you have no idea how things get recontextualized etc and um, and so I was thinking well in the future, curators and conservators and registrars will be the ones who will intervene in this material in the same way that the author intervenes in it. You mm -hmm. know, like I can be like, I'm the author of this work, I can say this is the material, this is the context, this is what I think it is. But once it goes out of the museum, the conservator, the registrar, the curator, the public will redefine what that is. And that is a sort of, not sort of a stuck as a, TMS straight up catalog, but is the, the beginning of that sort of sorting and understanding of material. And so what I thought it's like, it's a, you know, all of the things that we see, including the bodies of people, exist in multiple categories. You know, they are like bone, yes, they are parts of a person, they are historical, they are all of the things. It's like thinking about tags, I'm like, what are all the tags that this material can exist? And so what I think uh, the root of the questions that I'm asking is how do we organize these tags? Because they all exist, but some of them we can see and some of them we can't see because we are presented with the uh, sorting of the prioritizing of some essential parts of the work, like it's a historical object or whatever, and then the other parts that 100% that material might be part of is um, not in the foreground, no? Mm -hmm. So those were the questions. When I was uh, thinking about these two specific words that you brought up, it's not necessarily that I'm all, we have to take care of the spirits because I have no idea how to do that myself, but it was a question of uh, what is the subcategory of material in a collection that was supposed to have a function that never stopped being that, you know, like somebody back in the day believed something was going to do something for eternity, you know, when people are like forever, never, never, whatever, no? Um, and what happens when that material uh, goes into an institution and becomes only historical? Then we really suspend a lot of things. Like, I'm like, how? And you can see it with kids, you know, like, why is it that when kids go into a room full of like, skeletons and stuff is very quiet and they're afraid is because they haven't suspended enough to be like it's only a historical object yet mm. you know and so so essentially when you read all of the letters together it's actually the same letter with mm. different specificity of like what is it you know they follow the same thing like thank you for letting me work with this like here's the thing and the structure generally is the same i literally i also thought that it was interesting that you thought you mentioned that the works might begin with the letter, but the letter actually gets made like the day of the opening because I'm unsure that the work will be, <laughs> um, that you might be, you know, as a public, I'm like, will people even get it? Because it looks good. You know, you're like, oh my God, this swirl thing looks so colorful. Like people are going to be like, it's beautiful. I'm like, no, it's a landscape. It's not abstraction. It's a realistic landscape of somebody's potential because I thought, you know, um, when I was thinking about this work, I was like, well, if I put it in like some sort of technology or whatever, we might be able to actually find where in the universe this might be, like oil spill in the middle of the ocean or like, mm. Mm, I don't know, mm. Google map search or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but then it's like, maybe we don't actually have to know where it is just as long as people understand that this might be a location 
Mm. I don't know that. So, um, so I don't think of myself as a defender of anything, just uh, more like question putter, mm. outer. <laughs> And I think we'll, we'll probably get to this in the third and fourth parts of this conversation, how like the curatorial framework and the curatorial language around an exhibition places this frame that, in which your work is then cataloged. Oh, yes. Yeah. Meta. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and but, I, you know, Mariana, you come to this in uh, the essay, and I was going to read a quote um, from your essay in which you point out that even as, you know, the curatorial frame starts to bind the work, Gala, and as you frame her practice, constantly is like moving towards like non-linearity, non-linearity and uncertainty, and like problematizing the lack of context and history in the work. So these were actually, um, I'll just read this quote. Little was known about the body at the Guangxi Museum other than its likely provenance from Xinjiang Dong, Guangzhou, which made it difficult for anyone, including Forrest Kim, to negotiate on their behalf. A terminal escape from the place that binds us wrestles with the challenges of reversing the ossified structural forces that transform corpses into commodities and lives into property. Rather than proposing a poetic unknowing of what the body would have wanted, the striations and swirls of ink map how immaterial histories can constitute part of ethnography today. This project hinges on uncertainty and non-linearity, and it problematizes the lack of context in history that is afforded by the institution. Um, so we'll look at more passages from your essay to anchor us throughout, but I want to focus or, and start with these final two lines of this graph about ethnography, um, in which you describe the immaterial history of Gala's work, the interpretation, the divining as a part of ethnography. Um, Gala, you point to this kind of uncertainty in uh, this letter about the Pyramid of the Sun, in which you describe the audience of the ritual element, elements inside of the pyramids, which might not have been an earthly one, and then ask the director to consider uh, the, sun, the sun god who might care that there is a relationship of the museum to a greater power and put replicas of the monoliths in, um, into the pyramid. So Mariana, I'm, I'm curious about how you place uh, at work in your own writing and in this essay with these places of uncertainty, especially as a critic, um, especially as criticism is an evaluative form. And we can also debate that. Um, how, do you, how do places of you know, doubt and non-linearity in Gala's works and art in general shape your evaluation of this of this practice. I mean, you're right. Oh, I think you have to come close. Yeah, really close. Really close. <laughs> um, I mean, I agree with you. I think criticism is and should be subjective, and part of that beauty is sort of reading into an artist's work something that maybe necessarily wasn't their intent. Um, I don't think I was necessarily saying that Gala was the defender of ghosts, um, so much as like opening up a space to think about how, <laughs> um, how practices that aren't inscribed within the systems of museums might form part of them. So um, it's tricky. I mean, I think it's easy to, or not easy, but it's interesting to theorize about the archives um, and their absences, and Sadia Hartman writes about, you know, um, the violence of the archive, especially in relation to how absences are wielded in relation to um, colonized or enslaved people, and how those absences are used to wield power, and, um, or I'm thinking of Diana Taylor and the archive and the repertoire, and how we're beginning to think about, partly I think through performance and ephemerality, how these more like intangible forms of art can begin to be not only inscribed, but how we can open up space for them to exist within museum systems. I don't think I'm advocating for like eliminating them altogether, but um, in criticism, I think it's difficult. I mean, part of it is like beginning to question like the naming of a collection, a collection that's named after its owner, right? Like why is this named after the guy that acquired it rather than after the place um, that it was taken from or, um, like the date, the date is super subjective. Like all this information that we get from museums, from registrars that we so often take as fact and actually they're not irrelevant. There's someone making these choices and um, beginning to open up space for um, unknowing or for uncertainty or for more context than we're used to about like charting movement, charting different forms of um, the ways in which the work has been installed, the ways in which the artist themselves talk about the work. Like, um, I think just like trying to be more conscious about those things that we so often take as fact and as secondary to criticism itself is important. 
I wanted to move to the second section, to this caption that um, I kept coming back to in, in the show. Um, and it's hidden in a corner. I read everything because that was read, in the corner. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did read everything. I was there for a long time. Um, and I kept coming back to this caption for forecasting signal, which is like just kind of hidden like an Easter egg. And it's a description of this piece. Um, this piece consists of fabric impregnated with graphite that's humidified with atmospheric water within the gallery and its drops creating a shower that stains the floor. Its title not only alludes to weather forecasts but also to second sight, the prediction of the future becomings of objects through the interpretation and the description that's imposed on them. And I know we wanted to talk about registrars and cataloging, so I thought that this was a way <laughs> to get to that because I always thought of second sight as um, just like a visionary way to see into the future or just like a visionary capacity, and I never heard this definition before. Um, and But this is threaded throughout your work, the way that an object changes in the future and lives and is used and handled in the future is completely contingent on how it was originally described and named and cataloged in the past. Um, and throughout the show, we're really invited to consider um, not only the materiality of collected items in terms of like their agency and affordances, but also how this act of naming changes how they move through history. So it's like a very clear, legible moment that you keep returning to, like the name of the object, its provenance, uh, why it was made, where it came from. And we see these images of Thompson, uh, Edward Thompson, the archeologist threaded throughout the show and his letters throughout the show. Uh, describing sets of remains that he would smuggle back in his luggage, um, offerings, curiosities, treasures. So in some of the main works of the show that end, not start, with letters, uh, this letter to Jane Pickering at the Peabody, you focus on objects dredged from the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza, housed at the Peabody as objects, but originally and still tributes to Chak, the Mayan rain god. Thompson, through legal fixing and colonial maneuvering, sidestepped their place. And the great irony of these treasures being just named as treasure, treasures to be conserved is that they were taken out of the water that preserved them. So the objects in the Peabody are actually held together um, in, in, with glue in this artificial dry state. And so care, as you write in this letter, in this proposal, is to consider what the rain would actually want. So I was really swept up in looking at these pieces, and I know, Mariana, you wanted to talk about the differences of um, this object across the exhibitions, and seeing like the glistening rainwater on these objects, and they're in the different shows. Um, and I'm guessing, is this the same kind of work, and just the start it's, at MUA? It's a new shape. It's a completely new one with the dust and copal mixed together with rainwater falling on it. Um, and I'm curious, as you look at these, as we look at these works, how you think of Second Sight in, in your work, how these speculations and newly named works that are both like artifact and ritual produce a different future. Just co coming back to that caption. Um, yeah, this specific work was, um, you know, the, many of the objects that were dredged from the cenote were these fabric fragments. Well, fabric frag fra fabric fragment looking objects because they uh, were clothes of people that were burnt pre getting into the cenote. And so they were already burnt before they had gone in there. And this um, basically just ash in the shape of a fabric was at the bottom and not moved for thousands of years. So when they start digging them up, obviously they start falling apart. And so it was, um, in the letters that I was looking at that the conservator is trying to teach Thompson how to squirt conservation glue in this dust to hold like a mold of this material into the shape of a fabric that doesn't exist anymore. And so I was thinking like that's actually what museums still do with everything where they're trying to like preserve the shape of a historical something that might not actually be there anymore. Somehow to be able to teach about whatever the purpose might be to teach about the ancient past or whatever, it's still making a, a context or shaping the whole thing, the entire, it's like making a movie or something. Um, but, you know, of course the past is not here anymore, so how do we imagine it, no? Mm -hmm. um, and so with this piece, it's um, made with, so in the storage, lots of this fabric, of course, is not fabric, so it like sheds 
uh, ash, I guess, mm -hmm. fabric ash. So during COVID, we collected some of this ash because I was thinking in terms of fragments, like what constitutes a whole? If this is not one fragment, it's one billion particles of ash and I have like 1,000 of them. Do I have the whole thing? Um, and so it was thinking through like fragments and also how, th how material leaves the institution besides just straight up uh, regulation type. And I was thinking, well, the institution is what's keeping this material separated from its last owner, which technically was the rain god because somebody gave it to him last. Um, and so um, the institution would be tasked to figure out a way to put those things back together. And so this work is uh, copal, which is uh, one of the main materials that was dredged with cenote, which is also a binder. And so I was thinking like, in the storage, there's uh, dust and binder in a institutional shape. And this work is a dust and binder in a ritual shape. And was the institution here, in one instance, is made to preserve the idea of uh, its methodology, et cetera. And here, it actually has to figure out how to think about any of, what other, um, stakeholders of this material might be. Not just human, could be like uh, immaterial or spiritual, etc. No, I'm like, I literally, the way that I just start works is like, here is a material and water every single stakeholder and suspend the practical parts, etc. and then just argue for each one and it just becomes very clear, no? Um, and so each, the, the images just show different ways that different institutions have tried to put that together, you know, some of them. And I also thought that in the process of figuring out how to fabricate this work as a contemporary work, the range also really tells a lot about the position of the institution towards thinking about that history. For example, some of them made an entire ritual about like audience participation and then you come and like you sprinkle water. It was a whole thing versus just practically just putting water in there just because you have to make an artwork, et cetera. And so it was just, uh, a, I think almost also for me, it was just like a uh, tool to understand how the institution would just think and deal with not only my work as a contemporary work, but also through the, the the specificity of each one of the material involved. Um, the best, for me personally, the moment was when the conservator of the Peabody came to see the show. She's actually the one who has to keep those things dry. Uh, and then she was asked to put water on it and she was really nervous. <laughs> and I was like, um, they were really nervous because to begin with they put it in a vitrine, and the moment that the curator touched the vitrine, everybody was like, oh, like you're not supposed to touch it type, and then like lifted it, and then she, uh, the curator asked her to squirt water on it, and she was like, oh my God, this is too much. It was a whole thing, you know? And so it was, it's thinking through the work, in terms of the future of things, it's just thinking, you know, the work has multiple levels of audiences, you know, like the first audience is actually the registrar who has to think about these works every day, and then the audience, the contemporary audience will be seeing something that might have already happened with the primary audience. You know, like whoever made those works um, had a conversation already, had to figure out like the climate of the room in terms of contemporary works too. Uh, and through those conversations, I think that in terms of a future, I hope that, at least for me, uh, that it would stick to other objects, no? This is just like one of infinite amounts of, you know, context that every material might have in there, no? Yeah, I love, I love that moment of uh, gas, like the gas moving across the group. That's, that's as, hello? The gasp that, <laughs> that the curators <laughs> had um, as water drip, dripped on this thing that they had spent years and years trying to keep dry and devoting time and care to keeping it in a dry, perfectly dry environment. Um, and I just, there's so many moments of like destabilization in each of the works where something that seems like a given is, you know, just very elegantly, very shown to just, to be the construction that is. Um, 
Hello. Okay. Um, but you know, curators and registrars and collectors have deeply emotional relationships to these objects too. There's hunches and there's intuition and they're grappling with unknown context and unknown origins. And so I love these moments where the scientific process of naming or the scientific assumption of, yeah, of having a, a dry space or the taxonomy that the work has been put in is as much a matter of a hierarchy as, as one of intuition too. So you show this moment as like unstable and open to revision. And Marianne, I want to let you respond to yeah, you as well. Yeah, I wanted to jump in with something. I love this work so much because I, I think it really um, makes super visually clear how um, the curator and the archivist and the registrar are, are already collaborators in this work, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like really pushing them into thinking about how to realize the work and putting that labor of care onto them, um, whereas it usually falls on the artist, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. On the one hand, it's sort of like inscribing these systems into the institution and having them think about, okay, what are different ways that we can realize the object's spiritual qualities within, you know, not leak and not getting leaks from the roof, not getting our whole collection wet, like climate control. I'm sure like the intricacies of all these works are really, really interesting. Um, and I'm also thinking about like in your own work and the multiple times that you've exhibited this work, how do you also think about the works movement and does that form part of its context? Like, do you like um, archive this anywhere and the different ways that it's been like evolving this like copal and dust and shifting and disintegrating? Well, the piece gets remade every time. And so I, uh, may maybe many practically in my studio, I just got my own cataloging system because it has been very difficult to figure out how to catalog my own work. Mm. I'm like stunted by all of the things that I have seen. I'm like, I don't actually know how I would even catalog things, but I need to do something for the practicality of the day-to-day -day running, because I'm like, oh no. Uh, but yes, there are definitely with this work, I have to do it because you know I made this, this very recent work, but I have been thinking about how would I document the specific, even though to me, like, I'm like, I'm done with this work because I've done my part. It's going, it's, mm -hmm. it's a direction work. People, institution receives the direction and they remake it, but each individual case is so different. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you look at this Apollo Biennial one, uh, which is this cube, uh, no, that one, it's made like this because they made a Hans Hacke before, oh condensation cube. And so they're like, well, in the practical parts of things, we've made this before. And so this is a way in which they made this, you know, they chose to make this. And I'm like, am I hacking a Hans Hacker? Because I want that back, if so. You know, like, because I have a collection of near art, like things that are near or similar to art, but not art because I can't afford it. And so, um, so this Hans Hacker was that. The one, for example, at uh, the other one, the, the last one, oh, this one was the one at the, uh, at the Radcliffe, Radcliffe Institute, yeah. and so it was, even though it's the, it's one of the smallest ones, because technically making a block of copal is very difficult, because it heats and cools in different ways, and it cracks in uh, it's it's specific um, mm. requirement. Um, uh, it was the, it was the one that the registrar wedded. So to me, I have this like moment with the like the most un giant art looking one as the um, the next one. This? Yeah, that one. Mm. It's just like a little cracker. But yeah. I'm like with this sheet of the most like because the other ones look like oh that was more art looking or whatever. But this one was the one that was so intense. That was like oh my god the the <laughs> tension and in the specificity of the context in which this was shown was a lot. And then in the following one, the current one that you've seen, they actually got this copal from those people in the, in the Templo Mayor that yeah. actually use copal daily. And so like the exhibition uh, producer person went mm -hmm. over there and like asked them like, where do you get your copal? And got like a giant, like same from the source. And so that is specific to that making that is different from the other one though. Um, also, if it's shown in a museum, you can't have water in there and moisture, and so we have, you have to have a conversation about how to offset those things, and it is made with the condensation of the space that's already there. No, and um, so, 
Mm. Were we talking about the future of things? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about my work, but in the future in the collection is uh, not necessarily that I'm proposing any sort of solution because I have no idea how to resolve these questions, but more like to get some of the things a little unstuck, you know, mm -hmm. because I think that many people in the conversations about like how to rethink about collections and all the problems of how a collection was built, etc., is becoming... Uh, the conversations become very practical and very single level. And luckily, as artists, we don't have to think very practically first. And so um, that's it. Yeah, I mean, when these moments of taxonomy are changed, for example, if Lucia is given her burial, burial rites or the rain god is given all of these receptacles in the museum, um, this is very abstract question, but do you think of an audience in the future encountering these kinds of pieces in a museum? Yes, so this is something, you know, all of those works that left the museum are in my personal collection because I haven't figured out how they exist as a work. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't circulate as, they don't get sold, they don't get collected, etc. because I'm like, how can I put uh, Lucia back in a museum when she just left, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, if the work is about leaving, but then somehow it still has to function in the world as my work or something. So I'm like, well, um, but I have been thinking about the future of the work and I'm thinking like, if it's not in a collection, how will, because now, you know, I also make these like big drawings too that feel like when you Google my name, is that's the one that you see and I'm like, that's kind of the, the B side of the, you know, the TMS work that I actually like, you know, but it's difficult to represent. Um, and so I was thinking like, if I die today in a hundred years from now, like how will people contextualize my work? And they'll be like, oh, she made these giant drawings. And I'm like, Ooh, but what about these other ones that are actually the root of the questions, no? But I thought, for example, with the rocks, the Teotihuacan rocks, which is a TBD donation to the government to replace, you know, they're supposed to go in the pyramid. Um, and, but with Lucia, I was thinking that it would, if an institution wanted to host it, it would have to accession it as a body instead of an artwork. And so it would change the container to fit the shape of the material inside. Mm. Because I think in the terms of a future, you think about like an Excel sheet and like a TMS and you're like author, title, material, blah, blah, no? Mm. And, um, but I was thinking with the, with, with the works in a collection, how the material is the actual thing that doesn't change and the categories are the ones that actually are more flexible than the mm. thing. And so instead of museum, it would be like cemetery. So then I'm like, okay, how does a cemetery accession bodies into it if this is an actual person? Uh, and that's how it would have to go in, no? Mm. Or, that the Teotihuacan rocks would have to be put in a pyramid, and so then the museum would become a pyramid somehow. Mm -hmm. Practical parts, TBD, no, but, um, but that's, the, that's the sense, of, you know, in terms of thinking about like repatriation or, or questions of, ge because many of the arguments about repatriation are attached to a geography, like location-based things, culture-based things, uh, living people-based things, so it's just like what, who, who are all of the stakeholders of this thing? What are the actual things that are possible? And many of the things are definitely necessary and possible, but mm. I'm just talking about the, the really specific ones, but there's like very limbo area. Then to change the function of the museum, mm. period. No, so it's just the box itself is the one that moves instead of the material inside, no? I think there's a, uh, may Maybe in a couple of interviews, I, I saw that you call the British Museum a tomb, that the British Museum oh, yeah. is effectively a tomb. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, and you mentioned taxonomy. Uh, but specific, mm -hmm. though, yes, the British Museum is specific because the ancient Egyptians, which they have the largest mm. collection of ancient Egyptians, they plan so well for their afterlife, so we actually know the conservation directions. Like, I'm not, I'm thinking about, like, uh, in terms of knowing what people actually wanted is very interesting when you go there because on the actual text you can read so-and-so 
reincarnated into this material and wants to be taken care of like this. And I'm like, the directions are even on the thing. Like, why do we, and I, and I think that maybe the adjustment is to think like, why do we think that someone's position or idea of what their future might be in the past mm. is not a valid point, you know mm. what I mean? Because we are like more advanced or whatever, we're like got internet. Mm. But I'm thinking like, that's the adjustment where it's like, I have no idea what happens when you die, period. And so, in a sense, if this person was really certain that that's what they wanted to do, like, I'm not the person to say that that didn't happen. Um, and it's also the question of thinking about, you know, when I always think about, like, when does a person become a dead person, become old enough to stop being a cadaver and become an artifact? And so, I'm like, and it changes depending on the country, which is very interesting. For example, in Italy is pre-World War I, then you can be an a artifact, but before you were a cadaver, unless there has been a crime. Mm -hmm. and, so it's a, and, and so that's why I'm so interested in policy, because it's actually the box defining how the material, which actually contains all those things, is actually molded and suspended from like, I'm like, because I went recently to Italy and I was talking to this conservator and they're so Catholic and Catholic people have very specific rules about like bodies, can touch, can't touch, no? But there's a caveat and I'm like, oh, it must be like a psychological thing where it's like we are trying to like position different methodology just to be able to suspend the things that we know to achieve some sort of like, uh, function that we're trying to get to, you know, like understanding of human, whatever, no? Mm. Um, yeah. But Gala, even in, in contemporary art, and I feel like your project that MOCA really, really made this clear, death maybe also happens once you like give your work to a museum or they buy it, <laughs> and it's like you no longer have any say in what is done to it. Um, uh. It's like artists, re I, especially in the United States, Be where... <laughs> <laughs> well, where... Um, property rights are so much like greater than artists' rights. Um, and so few artists, I think, are thinking about the legal afterlife of their works, like really in the way that like, and I mentioned Felix Gonzalez Torres in my essay, who I love, but he, you know, his certificates of authenticity really were just like, it, yeah, like he, obviously he was thinking about death his whole life, um, but thinking about how the works would exist after him and we, uh, uh, that's one of the few examples where I can think of like, okay, this is a work that we are like caring for because he made us care for it. Um, and I'm wondering if like, I don't know if it's like, it, it sounds boring or like, I just feel like no artists are really super interested in thinking about. That's the best part. <laughs> exactly. I think that artists are thinking about it, just not so directly. Yeah. You know, I think that mm, I can't project but I do hang out with a lot of students and it's like, okay, how do I make a show? How do I become an artist? How do I like, make, you know? And I think that in the, um, in the day to day, the making of an artist is not necessarily so within your own capability, but within the context in which you exist, you know? It's like, well, there are amazing artists that are, you know, people are like, well, what was it? I saw a caption in Mexico that was like, so-and-so is the first Sculpture, sculpture woman in Mexico because she graduated from school. And I was like, but about all of the previous, and so it's just this sort of like the professionalization of what art might be. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that it, that once it comes into a museum, then it's like the methodology has been set mm -hmm. very specifically. And so I think that. Um, I think people are thinking about it, no? Like how to, mm, I think besides the practical parts, you yeah. know, like, oh, I need to like make a living or like have a show, those are practical things. Uh, more like how, I think it's time when uh, the material itself is not just the physical thing that you actually like see like, okay, like this is clay or whatever, but more like if I put the clay in, this is so different than here or, you know, and, the containers are, you know, people have been thinking about this since the dematerialization of the artwork. When you mm -hmm. see the toilet, Duchamp, onward, yeah. it's like, stuck. I actually saw this really funny uh, 
picture on the internet that's um, somebody put like their own work into the tape next to the toilet and was like, if they want to have a toilet, then I can put even better work. Look at my painting of this octopus. And then I was like, yes, of course, it's a toilet. Like, yeah. why, how did we stop suspending that that was just like straight up a toilet, you know? Um, and, so, and so the institution, I think that with those moments, maybe it's a West Coast thing. I can't, I can't really anticipate, but I hope that people are thinking about it. No? Yeah. I think people are thinking about it, it's just not so directly. Hmm. You I know, like, how can I make my painting be worth more? If it's a drawing, then it's less, but if it's a painting, it's more. This type of thing is that, you know, like, in the practicality of be being an artist, you have to make weird choices about, like, where you put your work, because the same material literally will be something else, specific, you know. It will be interesting to go see the fair this week. This is very relevant. Just to go booth by booth and be like, oh what God. is the context that yeah. makes the content of this work more than it's the actual, you know? Mm -hmm. I think especially with like performance, it's really fascinating um, how part of it is our obsession to like own and catalog and archive everything. And, and we're right to do it. I mean, we're building a history um, for for a growing field, especially in the past few years, but like, um, at what <laughs> point is something, Gala did a show at MoCA, what was it, 2018? Uh, yeah, 18, 19. It was up 2019, when pandemic started. Right, um, where she took works in MoCA's collection and sort of started thinking about like their like legal context and how they were acquired and um, how they came to be and how that often came into conflict with the artist's intent and one piece was, a piano by Rafael Montañez Ortiz that he like destroyed during a performance, like one of his infamous like piano smashing it's concerts. To, it's to um, liberate the material exactly. from its colonial shape. Exactly. So so much of his work is about like anti commodification, like decolonialism, and then this work was like acquired by the museum and categorized as a sculpture in its collection, probably like maybe somewhat haphazardly by it's someone. It's a registrar being like, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and Gala like entered into this conversation with the artist, right? With the artists and with registrars and with like curators and had it changed back to destroyed piano instead of sculpture. He wanted a compromise because he was like, they're never going to deaccession that material uh, now that it's in there. But he said, now they, I would like it if uh, they show it with a video of the moment of liberation, so the people can see the moment in which this piano stopped being a piano and became wood again. And also that the museum, we planted trees of the wood species of the piano all around the planters in Mocha. And so, so it was very funny uh, as a curatorial assistant having to research what this piano was actually made out of so we could reconstitute some of the wood back as a compromise, no? And it's funny, but it also pushes the museum yes. into like constantly planting trees and doing this like constant upkeep that we sometimes don't do if a work ends up in storage for 10, 20 years. Yeah, that was a, I think that that show made me really, it's, it was thinking about how much does a, or uh, initial author or, you know, same with antiquity, like who was the stake, the same, who's the original OG stakeholder, first stakeholder of this material. And of course with contemporary art is the author and people are like, what would the author want, or et cetera. Right. But I think that um, I looked in the collection for works that were, uh, especially because MoCA is uh, the artist museum. So I'm like, does the artist have a say over their work beyond the institution. So for example, if I want to change my work while I'm alive, am I, am I allowed to do it because it's my work? And people are like, what would the artist want? And I'm like, I want to change it. But now it's in a collection, and so does it belong to me anymore enough that I could do it? And so I was looking for different examples in the um, collection in which this might have happened, and it ra it's a wide range from changing the title of something back and forth, back and forth, to changing the entire uh, material uh, integrity of the work, or even going against the conceptual work, uh, the conceptual framework of that original work. So, for example, the biggest 
uh, thing that I found was that uh, Michael Heitz were double negative, so he's, you know, that work that is two slots in the mountain that's supposed to fall apart because of the earthwork, et cetera. He was fundraising to conserve it, and I was like, how is that work is supposed to fall apart, mm -hmm. you know? And so in a sense, it's just thinking, not that artists are always knows what's best i don't know if right that's a big i don't i don't try not to i try to avoid right. like straight on value judgment no because he might have his own intention for that or whatever no but um but in a sense it's just thinking about the wide range of like uh instances in which that especially because author is still around and so but you know looking at those materials and thinking through those questions is exactly the same thing as thinking about like someone in antiquity who had some a specific um, again that subsection of things that were supposed to stay a specific way forever because I'm assuming that as an author of an, a contemporary work you assume that people will try to preserve that idea or whatever the, the work is about forever or until it falls yeah. apart no but these are questions about then we get into like conservation you know in terms of like what does forever actually mean if we're should we keep everything forever don't we have like so much stuff anyway like i have not been to a museum that is not full in the storage anywhere ever and so in a sense it's also thinking about conservation uh more as the uh, as the uh, controlling the rate of decay of something instead of trying to preserve something forever, no? Because conservators definitely let things fall apart faster than others, even just by out of sight, out of mind, just because it's physically impossible to maintain something. So in an institution there, it, it manifests actually in the landscape of the storage because they have main climate control storage uh, off-site somewhat sometimes climate control storage like even off offsite not climate control storage and even like but no so as it gets further and further i was thinking like if the institution is tasked to conserve everything forever these are like actual manifestations of the practical parts of that task you know where it's like you can't actually preserve anything so how do we how does a conservator in there like it's like doctors you know, with people. It's like at some point you have to figure out what is the, the, it's going out anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in your essay, especially in this quote up here, Mariana, you talk um, and speak to Gala's contention or your, and your contention as well that, you know, taxonomies can be thrown out altogether once you display this rigorous kind of breakdown of like the construction and also if, um, especially this last piece here, the importance of Gala's own gesture that's, that's missing there, places on objects cultural and spiritual import doesn't attempt to be a fix-all for the injuries of the past, but it does begin to call into question the limits of existing paradigms that disregard these qualities altogether. The failure to care for archeological objects whose makers and owners were afforded few or no legal rights seems inevitable given these limits. I had a big question about natural truth and I think I'm gonna, we can come back to it at the end. But I wanted to move forward, um, you know, to, and also, you know, you described the container changing to fit the artwork, which I thought was really beautiful. And you had that in, you know, in your PST show, you identified, you know, the works, insisted the works of the, of the original oh, yeah. collector were, de were described in the caption. Um, <laughs> and then at LACMA, there was like a challenge to update the provenance to, um, it was like, Unidentified mm -hmm. grave looters, and yeah, then to have that looted, you because know, they're they were like, looted. They tell you in the card is like these objects were buried with somebody, then they were looted, then they were this. They tell you already. So yeah. when you look at the provenance in the catalog, I'm like, yeah. why isn't it like unknown West looter, you know, looters of West Mexico are not also mm -hmm. part of the provenance of this work, mm -hmm. or like a dead person originally, or like whatever. No, mm -hmm. so. I just try to be very practical about like what the task is. It's like if mm -hmm. this is what is actually supposed to be, then you have to go all the way. You're not just like half these because then it really shows the position of like what do you actually take as like legit information and like irrelevant information mm -hmm. when it's all the same value, you know? I mean, and I, I this this these pieces, the offerings for the rain at the Peabody Museum, I have some like close ups in addition to like the install shots. Um, you know, since so much of your investigation starts with the ledger, starts with 
the Excel sheet starts with the spreadsheet and the cataloging of the object. Um, these pieces, oops, um, offerings for the rain at the Peabody Museum, I think it's 254 offerings up to 2,576 offerings uh, in which you present all of the objects in the sacred cenote and like these painstakingly hand-drawn and painted representations. Drawing. Drawings. Um, but you also use the language of the records of the Peabody and in these pieces. Um, I, I read these as you working as a registrar in a way. It's more like fact check. If you go, if I could, if you go to the last one, the mm -hmm. new one, no, that one. Mm -hmm. So that one is uh, the newest one, mm -hmm. which I, I think is a good example of how these work because they are kind of fact check registration works. So they're like organized literally, it's just literally depicting what the catalog says. It's like this is the order, this is the dimension, this is blah. So if there's a typo, you can actually see it, or if there's something. And so, for example, this is the new work because the third part of the work were the objects that were returned to Mexico. Mexico sued the Peabody in the 60s, and then uh, 69, some of the gold and jade objects were returned. Um, but uh, again, another like ch change. And then the gold objects stayed in Mexico City, and then the jade objects went to Merida, and then in Merida they divided to other collections, etc. But with this work, um, the way that I made it was that I got a list from the Peabody in order of the things that they had returned. Um, and I got a list from MUAC, uh, from INA, the cultural ministry in Mexico, of the things they received. And they were very different. And so it was really interesting just to even do like, okay, what is it look like? And so this is a drawing of a literal depiction of what the INA received. and what they think they have in their collection. Um, and you can see in the, that there's some black and white, not that one. There's some black and white, you know, gold disc and black and white disc because there was no object in the museum. And so in a sense, um, I, want a, I want a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, next to the gold disc, there's like two little dudes right there. And then underneath on the shelf below, there's two, uh, little persons at the end too. So two of those dudes are made out of gold and two of them are copper, but they are cataloged differently. And there's no way that you would know that from a list of catalogs, but because we have drawn them, I can tell that one of them is copper and one of them is gold. And so because they look so similar, somebody just was like, it has patina and it's like two bronze things, check. Two gold things, check. But when you look at it closely, even though those small decisions feel arbitrary in the moment. Over thousands of years, they will actually mean that something ends up in a collection or something ends up in somebody's house or something ends up back in the cenote. Like it, it, it can have unpredictable futures that are not the same anymore, which I think is amazing. And so that's the, the that's how those things are. So in the other one, if you show the... You want me to go for Maybe the, which one's a good one? Necklace one is good. Yeah, so for example, the register at some point received a box full of beads and conservator put these little beads in a backing to just display it or something, but they now are organized like this, like one, two, three, four, five, like this. But for example, they had 1,000 beads and a conservator put them in the shape of a necklace and now is one singular necklace that did not exist in antiquity mm. in that shape. So then in those, and I think that that's why the drawings, even though they take forever to make, is because of that time. Because then it's not just like a line in a, a Excel type, but you can actually see what what it might be in because like you have to stare at it forever you're like that's not made out of gold you know mm -hmm. and think through those questions i mean do you find that registrars are very interested in your work maybe a little bit more than the directors who receive the letters that you pose i mean because because they're thinking about all, all of these questions not just like the smell and the weight and the texture yeah. but how the categories came to be yes yeah, so um so i'm actually giving ina all of the images and information that we got during this thing so they can just um, see because they, 
neither of them actually know. Mm. I mean, it's also like, it's a lot of information and like you have to be, the museum definitely doesn't have the, I don't think that any institution has the capability of maintaining the record of everything they have and every single step and change that happened in its life. And so this one is just like, I guess community service for a minute, no? Mm. They're really stunning and in, in person and- um, Also, I want to be a registrar, but I, don't, I need a I would, job of like- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, it's hard not to be like seduced by the, the method and order, especially when you're, you know, face to face with pieces. Mm -hmm. Brass, I mean, you go the copper, bottom. The two dudes at the bottom. Mm -hmm. are, but they look exactly the same as you, sorry. That no, was really exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. look, it's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I just, I'm curious about like what aspect you just mentioned wanting to be a registrar. Like what are some of the aspects of what a registrar does like in relation to your work? Like whether it's the ethics of re registrar work or how they acquire an accession or how they manage risk. Like how do you think of the potential of what the registrar does? I think registrar is like almost the same as artists. Because mm -hmm. they are, uh, you said it in your, what was the word? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can use your word. No, but when I read it, I was like, yes, that. Um, you know, a registrar is actually translating for uh, the deep vault of institution, whatever the material is. And so in a sense, it's just thinking about like, the who is responsible for the information more than the author in terms of like longevity of institutional life, mm -hmm. which I guess in contemporary terms and contemporary art museums are the main stockpile and container for that, no? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I, I think that maybe these questions begun when museums started getting my work and I got that uh, registrar uh, interview because you get a questionnaire mm -hmm. like how do you want this to be in the future if you're like these are questions I actually cannot answer because there's no way to anticipate how like what do I want where do I want my work to be once the museum doesn't exist anymore I have no idea you know mm. and so I think that of course they're trying to find a practical solution but I think that because I have seen how it has gone for so many historical objects it's like, that's gonna happen to everybody who's not thinking about like the specificity of like, uh, you know, what is it, what, where is the essential parts of that work? Mm -hmm. I actually had a very interesting conversation with uh, uh, a committee recently because they said, well, you know, they're drawings on paper so they are very fragile, I guess if you spray saws on it, it's over. But, um, but, uh, they said, what, what type of conservation would you like for this work to happen? And I just said, well, you should just remake it from scratch. And they're like, well, what? No. no. And then I thought, I don't know many programs and MFAs that are actually teaching the technical parts of making things as much as registrars know how to make. I'm like, registrars know how to make stuff way better than contemporary artists these days. Uh, because they're actually looking at material and doing all of that. And I'm like, if my drawing gets destroyed, somebody at the museum will actually be uh, able to make it better than I can actually make it in the studio because mm -hmm. they know. And because the essential parts of the work are not stuck in the paper itself, but in something else, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, they would actually be able to get an even closer viewing of that work by spending all the time it takes to remake one. Mm. You know? Mariana, do you want to do you want to add on? I was just thinking about how that like that makes your work a set of instructions, right? And you're just like giving them one example and it's like when I'm no longer here, you should keep doing that and keep doing that into practice of like intimacy and spirituality with these works that is so often divorced from like the fast pace of like having to bring works into the collection, having to archive them, having to put them on display. I mean, to, to get ready for this conversation, I looked at lots of registrar that guys. Amazing. I was like, I thought that we were just going to talk about that. <laughs> I thought the, the, entire talk, yeah, the, the entire talk could have been about this. And for writers and artists in the audience, I don't know if you've ever 
looked at the Getty Registrar Handbook. It's like 350 pages. It's incredible and just astonishing like taxonomies about how to name every single thing that one could possibly come across. Um, like if a fact, you know, this, this page, avoid bias or critical judgment, both ne negative and positive. And I thought this was funny in, in the context of your work, express all information in neutral tone, do not write from a subjective or biased point of view. And then the guide proceeds to show the construction of a very specific <laughs> social and historical way of naming things. Okay. Um, like, can we put like how the mold would feel about this, <laughs> like tastiest to least tasty for the mold? But there's a lot of there's a lot of pieces in the catalog about unknowable information. Like there are entire yes. sections of like if you do not know something, how do you catalog it? So make sure to use terms like unknown, unavailable, undetermined, and not applicable because that then implies that it will be known, it will be found, mm -hmm. it will be learned at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I mean, just the, my favorite page is like indexing, displaying, and best practice, practices for uncertainty was another title. Like it's, it's poetry, I really suggest this yeah. guide. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to like to move into the final part of the conversation, like a question for you both. Um, you know, in your practice as an art critic and yours as an artist, like are there ways of cataloging, naming, and registering that you see have seen be so used as to be unquestionable? And because you've been talking about the work of the registrar is also one full of doubt and speculation, like very educated kind of fabulation. Um, but a registrar also has to recontextualize works, especially when they have no spiritual or cultural mm -hmm. or like emotional effective um, link to the work itself. So it seems there's a lot of poetry and cataloging and space for like the unknown in oh, museum yeah. and museum taxo and taxonomy. So how often do you find that you have the space um, to question like these, this immovable taxonomy of like objects and artworks that you encounter and not even necessarily specifically in your, in your own work? And where do you find and where can the rest of us find these like points of entry to like even ask these questions and, and you know destabilize this you know 400 page guide of naming. I think it's, it would be a really interesting exercise just to be like what kind of tags you can add on to things. You know what I mean? Like open source tagging. You know, like, uh, you know, you have the collection and it's available for everybody to just be like, this is what this is. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in a sense, um, the thing that I have seen that is set is not necessarily dependent on the catalog, but I think that is how the, oh shit, what is, the disclaimer goes. Mm -hmm. It's not about the, the way it's categorized, but the disclaimer, more like once you go into this specific catalog, you will see this specific taxonomy mm -hmm. because that's what we need for practicality, mm -hmm. like alphabetized the end, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's not to set it permanently where it's like, that's what I think is essential, that it's like, it's about the disclaimer to be like, this is a singular way that we're using just for technical, practical parts of our own current day working, you know, because we need to uh, agree on some things, you know, like collective, the catalog works because we collectively understand that that's the order, no? Uh, but of course, like each individual person has their own way of accessing or one, you know, I'm like, when I was, I wanted to sleep longer today and I'm like, well, maybe I can make it be like, instead of an hour being 60 minutes, it was gonna be 120 minutes now. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're, so, we're still at an hour. Huh? We're, we're in good on time. Oh yeah, yeah, no, but wh what I was saying was that, oh, can I, if I disclaimer that, then that means like it, I have to make it consistent in every section of life and I don't wanna like work at more things longer than I have to in other parts of life, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so that's what I'm talking about. It's like a lot of disclaimering of how it is because in a sense it's not necessarily um, permanently set anywhere, no? Mm. Mariana? I don't know, it's, it's scary looking at all these categories. It just feels very like right and wrong. Even when you don't know something, it's, you can either be right about saying it's unknown or unavailable or unapplicable, I mean, it's really, really prescriptive, even when you're making room for uncertainty. I was like, as Gala was talking, I was thinking about like, what are other ways that we can sort of like, 
I like the way that you refer in your work to something as like a jade necklace sometimes, and then other times a ritual offering, and then All like a possess. It's like, you know, it's not consistent because we don't know what the maker would have wanted us to refer to the work as. So it's like, here are all these things that I'm drawing from it. Like, uh, I, th I think a simple way that I have worked through many of these more difficult questions is just like when you go to a friend's house and you look at how they organize their books, <laughs> you know, because it's like you can really see so much about. For example, a book that might be philosophy and like women authors or like specific things about the story, fiction, whatever. But it fits in all of them. So how are they going to decide? And so I was thinking like that's a very difficult question because all of these, you know, specifically when you know them, it's like they're into these major things and there must have been a conflict moment in which that book is like, where does it go? No. And I think that maybe a good exercise is to reorganize books once in a while because 10 years ago you might have organized them away, but now it's different because you reread everything and uh, to, to basically when you reorganize, not to, to start from scratch, not from, of course you have to have some guidelines, but just not to be like, I should put this here just because it has been put here before, mm -hmm. but more to be like, Maybe right now I feel like this is going to be here just for a minute and then I'll put it back there. Even if it's by like color of the cover or whatever, but temporary. No? Mm -hmm. I thought we could close just with one last um, note. I, you know, I haven't, I've read all the reviews that there are on you, Gala, and um, I noticed that people are really careful not to call your work decolonial or that you're motivated by a decolonial ethic, but I think it'd be really hard to not um, see how like larger conversations around repatriation and museums like reflecting on their history have like made it um, like made a fertile ground for like understanding your work and understanding like the ethos. Um, and I think, I'm gonna skip over these works. Mariana, you described this as in terms of like Zoe Samuzzi's Necropo Necropolitical Museum, the Necropolitical Impulse of the Colonial Museum. Um, so, I mean, I thought we could close on thinking about like some, what this conversation on taxonomy, if there are new taxonomies for these immaterial qualities of objects. Um, and there are lots of activists and museums and thinkers who are thinking about like, what does a museum do with all of these objects that it had one no right to in, in the first place and to the a taxonomy that's bankrupt in so many ways. So how do you see museums um, considering the objects they possess and steward uh, within this context of looting and violent de decontextualization? Um, how do you imagine museums like bridging these crises in the future? That's very difficult because I think that you have to really consider the individual stories of the material that's in the building because they all got there. Uh, they had a different function originally. They got, you know, the trajectory of how it ended up here is very specific to each individual work, even down to those like displays where it's like all plates, like all the plates came from different places. And so that's the amount of labor that needs to go into actually considering what to do with this work. It's like this plate came from like so and so and this plate and like actually, and so it's almost an impossible task. But I think that that's why it becomes philosophical. You know, beyond the practical parts of what we can do now, how do you imagine things beyond just geography or uh, I was thinking, you know, I'm in England a lot, so I'm thinking about that. Did you read that, um, the British Museum and the um, Benin Bronzes? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like, oh, the Benin Bronzes, biggest like repatriation thing. So they're gonna ask him to go back to Benin. And, and I'm like, it's, are they probably gonna go back to a museum? But those were actually part of the royal family. So is there a living descendant of the royal family who that actually belongs to because it's a person whose actual house got looted, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was thinking like, if you suspend the practical parts of things, then would, if the Benin Bronzes stay in the specific museum, would the museum become part of their property? You know, it's like, okay, well you have my stuff in your box and so that box is mine by default because mm -hmm. you have my things in it. Mm -hmm. And so, or even changing like the country itself, like can we put, can then Benin become? transplanted in 
be put in like whatever collection, you know, whatever country that has a, one of those objects turns into Benin legally or whatever, no? Hmm. And so it's just suspending, of course, the nature of things and just being like, just to reshuffle things about the, uh, when you see the trajectory of a history of a specific material and you like list all of the stakeholders and list all of the geographies, et cetera, et cetera, just be like, just massage like all of the options of impracticality just to be like, then it's easier to just suspend what feels good and at the moment mm -hmm. and being like, what are the things that we're choosing to consider? Because I was like, doesn't they have like a, there must be an individual person who's like, that was my grandpa's, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I want to melt it, mm -hmm. you know? I'm mm -hmm. like, why not? Mm -hmm. It's like national treasure, but mm -hmm. then like, when did it become that? You know, this type of question. Also, it's interesting when it becomes from, you know, private something into public something, because as a private owner, you can do things to your own property, mm. like legally. That's something that I think about. It's like, if a collector has my work, it's their private property, and they're like, I want it to be pink today, would they like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they could Perfect. legally, mm -hmm. no? Mm. Mariana? That's a really hard question. I mean, it's... Yeah, I think it's looking at the museum, it's what Gala does, looking at the museum as a microcosm for like the legal systems that we have in place in society at large and how we value personhood, objecthood, permanence, ownership. I mean, it's really no small task to change the labeling of one object and to try to begin to think about like how we can factor in like different makers that we like dispossessed of agency so violently and now we're trying to right these wrongs and there's no way to like take the work back and just like you know check the check mark um but i do think it's it's really beautiful and important to have artists like Ala beginning to think about um how can we question these systems moving forward well said thank you both let's have some questions from the audience do we have time for a couple We have a microphone so everyone can hear. No? Is it the microphone? There's a question. <laughs> I don't know if it's a question as much as it's just a thought that came up. As you were talking, I kind of kept pondering over like culturally specific artists like David Hammonds or like, you know, those types of voices where I think at one point you sort of said like what it looks like when the object sort of represents a culture. So I was thinking through like the Snowball series and like how that just obviously would never have a life in a museum. It just can't and it perplexes us. But if it represents this idea of culture and he's almost saying like I want to insert my culture into this space because as you maybe have said like there's much more protection for it inside of a museum than it would be outside of a space. I just, the thought was really like interesting so I wonder you know what your thoughts were on things yeah like but that. I think that with that I love that work so I learned so much and I think is mostly thinking about what is the actual material of that work because it's beyond just the snow you know it's not like the snow is just a like kind of like a you know when you go to science fair project is the maquette some physical thing that we might be able to experience but that work is about the moment in which that was made, the street, the uh, way that it was, uh, you know, as a performative material, the culture, if it was, so all of these immaterial things. And so I actually um, think with these uh, performative works and conceptual works that are beyond just a material uh, thing, that it's interesting to just see how those get those could be cataloged or registered or conserved or preserved because I feel like they are not stored in a, uh, regular storage with climate control, but it's installed in somebody's mind. And so like, how do you keep your mind sharp and clean to be able to maintain the integrity of that work without like, what would be the equivalent of like mold of the mind? You know what I mean? And so it has different conservation needs like, you can't, you have to, um, yeah, it's just thinking like, how would you preserve something that is installed elsewhere, no? Or more like with that type of work, what kind of 
institution does it need that is not a box or a museum, but like people or brains or, you know, et cetera. And I think of the work of artists that work so thoughtfully around site specificity, like Carolyn Lazard or Park MacArthur, and how um, the exhibition context like completely determines what the work is and what happens to it afterwards. And like beginning, also thinking about how like so many works are just incompatible with the museum period, right? And like being okay with, with that. I don't know, it's, it's tough. <laughs> But I think it's really interesting to follow. I'm thinking like, because I have been, th you know, I, I did uh, study a lot of conceptual works being here in California, et cetera, and I was thinking like, mm, how, does, how does the care of those works manifest itself in like the structures of preservation and registration colorways? And I was like, would, would the like pharmaceutical company that makes good memory medicine be now uh, involved in the arts because it helps you keep a sharper mind so you don't you know what I mean like how does if you continue with the ripple of that then how does that actually change the entire infrastructure but I'm like well ginkgo for conservation <laughs> of conceptual <It's> work <laughs> any other questions now's your chance I think there's a tentative hand over here. <laughs> really shine. Yeah, thanks so much. This uh, was really fascinating. Um, I was thinking about a number of different cases in which we can think about immateriality without going back to materiality. Because what's quite fa interesting is that, you know, as we're speaking about spirits and voices and, uh, you know, uh, souls and um, we keep going back to material objects or to, to a certain form of materiality. And I'm sort of wondering about different examples where the material is itself a medium, because that's in some ways what it seems to me uh, the case. And I was thinking in particular about a collection of quite fascinating wax cylinders um, that are in the ethnological collection of the Humboldt yeah. Forum in Berlin. And those um, you know, the former director has written a book about this called uh, sort of Captured Voices because essentially these wax cylinders were capturing, um, you know, voices of prison inmates of the German colonies. And what's quite interesting about these wax cylinders is that they are on the one hand really violent objects because they captured these voices that were forcibly um, recorded, but on the other hand, and this is another interesting link, um, they were sometimes not properly analyzed, so a lot of these uh, recordings were actually making fun of the people recording them. And so there have been now attempts to try and look at the cracks and where the voices recorded were somehow interrupting that attempt to capture these voices. Um, and so in some ways I'm thinking, you know, where are those cracks? And it seems a little bit that that's what you're trying to do, to get into these cracks uh, and to find these voices that are that are coming out. Um, and that for me is an example where the, me the materiality is only a medium, but it's not the main focus. Oh yeah. Yeah, if it was the main thing, we would be like thinking about wax. Like, what do the bees have to do with the content of that voice, you know? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that many of the works are just kind of props or something, you know what I mean? Like, because I am a, con I am, I like making the drawings also because they make they help me think through these bigger questions because I'm like, if I didn't have the next three months to make this work, then I would just be like watching movies the whole time and doing like day to day to day, you know, like going to all the parties at the fair instead of going to the studio and drawing or whatever, you know? And so I think the, the my own work is, uh, is materiality. It's like a, um, kind of like a, strategy for my own life, you know, because they have to uh, be created within my own artistic trajectory. And I was like, I got, I need to make a giant chunk. Of course, I picked the colors of the swirl. You know, there are, if you look, if you follow my own uh, position in the like things that are 
are decisions that are made that I have made that people don't think about so much. I'm like, I picked the color. I picked the orange one and the blue one just because it was arbitrary. Like, I picked the time in which that was sitting on the bin before it was printed. Like, I picked the frame. I picked that it was vertical. I picked the size. All of these things, you know. And so that's why I think that because those things are not discussed, I, I hope that they're not discussed, is because that work is not about the specific object itself. It's more like we need props to get to the other thing. Okay. Oh, two questions up here. Yeah, um, I was struck by your work concerning like returning ownership of those objects that were offered to the rain god like and trying to bring back ownership to the rightful owner and it got me thinking about how um, you know we're still you know discovering artifacts in new digs and new sites and how you think for like you know the future objects that are coming that are going to come into like research and institutional possession um, how we should balance building out knowledge and research about our collective you know, culture and history uh, with honoring the ownership and, in, and intent and wishes of the original people that created them. I think it's an interesting moment now because people are actually thinking a lot about that. You know, I spent two years at the Getty. People are like trying to figure out how to like uh, balance knowing stuff about history and also keeping it in the same location. So for example, they were uncovering these mosaics but they left, they uncovered it, photographed it, documented it, and put it back. And so it was more like the ground is the biggest storage space there is, and so it's already there. And so there is no amount of buildings that we can put that will, uh, because I was thinking, when now with LIDAR and all of these like ground penetrating things, like we're gonna literally find everything a human has ever made, ever. And so if you think about like, when I go to the, secondhand store, I'm like, this is times a million, you know, where are you going to even put it, you know? And so I think that um, many institutions are uh, coming to this, this moment, I think is happening because the technology is available to get all of those things so quickly. You know, I, uh, when you think about the, oh my God, what was that, Sarah? Who's that lady that won like the TED Talk thing because she found like, uh, Sarah, she, she made crowdsource, she had a satellite and basically found all of these things in Egypt that like archaeologists had their entire life just finding one section of that and she did it in like 20 minutes or something. And now she has put it up on like crowdsource so there's all these people who can access it and play it like a video game. Like, find all the dots that are follow this pattern. And so you have unlimited amounts and you can imagine how that might destabilize the, <laughs> the entire thing. But I don't necessarily know how it's gonna go, but definitely there's no more space in the storage. Or, <laughs> you know, and, oh, and so it's a question also, it changes depends on what type of storage, but I think that one of the issues is also that there's zero deaccession policy of anything. And so I'm thinking like, if there's a container and there's an intake, like the same rate has to come out, <laughs> otherwise it doesn't work, you know? Um, but, but it's again, uh, having to deal with the readjustment of the expectation that the public has of the institution that they might be able to actually care for all the things they have that the way that we imagine they're actually doing. Hmm. I think there's a question in front of you. Yeah. Hi. Um, when you're talking about public-private or like when the, the, the kingdom, for example, and you're saying what if there's a relative of the you know, of the king and maybe he should get it. I started thinking about what happens uh, when, you know, larger power shifts happen all the time within their own cultures, like mm -hmm. take the czars, for, like the overflow of the overthrow of the czar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the art in the czar, in where the czar lived, it didn't go to the, it was supposed to, I guess, go to the people. That would be the right. idea, but we all know that that's not what happened. It got reconsolidated and now a lot of it's in, 
you know, a museum, which presumably is for the people. But anyway, the point is, is that these, these power shifts happen all the time in different ways. And in ancient times, we don't really know how they played out exactly. So right. I mean, we speculate, but... But I think that that's why I think it has to do with like, is like natu national pa patrimony or private possession versus like something that defines, like why is it called an entire culture's bronzes instead of like an like individual? Universal heritage. Yeah, so like it's a cataloging question again, you right. know, because it does belong to all of them at some point. It's just more like the, the caveat of the time period and the circumstance. So you think it should be like listed as like property of Tsar Nicholas II? I mean, I, it, maybe it is. I, don't I, I think it should be noted as part of the provenance. Like every single section should be I don't know whose it should belong to. That's a very difficult question, and I have no idea because I don't know the specificity of each of the cases, and I'm not like the law or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I do think that uh, it just depends. Like wherever they end up, they will have a specific position, and so I think that maybe it's just keeping that not so set. You know what I mean? Or maybe maybe they can like. Hey, it's thinking also about like what was the damage that was caused by taking something if it if it was like that people were not all able to like learn about something because they didn't have that anymore then what would be a compromise for how would you return that amount of knowledge to that place you know and it's like it doesn't necessarily have to be about like building more schools or whatever like we're going to build 100 buildings because but no but more like how do you, what are different ways in which there can be compromise if things can't actually have a solution? Um, and so again, it's like looking at what are all the stakeholders of everything and what was taken and what was lost, what was like about all of the receipts of every transaction and be like, is everybody cool or whatever, no? Um, yeah. The, the other caveat to that that I had that was a question was what if a particular society was like, like like the like the Nazis, you know, like they created stuff. Yeah. You know, are, are we supposed to cast moral judgments on that? Well, I mean, they did on their own culture. They decided to dismantle as many buildings as possible and whatever. But for antiquity, it's harder to know that. Yeah, because I mean, even within Mesoamerica, people are like, okay, is you know, they had way worse battles amongst <laughs> themselves back then. And so it's just thinking about like, which section are we looking at? But I do think that it's, it's more like, now with technology, we can have like all of those tags be available. And so it's not necessarily that we have a value judgment of which like, which one is the proper one or whatever, but more like, now that we know the entire thing, we might be able to be like, having a set like, this is right and this is wrong, because it's more like, this is, temporarily what we need now and then it will be um you know not like that forever wonderful well i want to thank you gala and mariana yeah. both for your generosity and everyone for your great questions and for your time thank you both so much thank you